thing about that slide from the old website is actually that there's a members only information area. I think that's a big, and it was password protected. So I think that's also a big change in the last 20 years that we're much more transparent, I think, about kind of information. And this meeting is an example of how we're, you know, encouraging lots of different voices as the community has diversified. Uh, Crossref is reflecting that more and more now. Um, so yeah, this is called the perceived value of Crossref, and it's um, it's going through uh, trying to attempt to summarise quite a large report. So Ed shared that that link, which you can download. It's a Google slide deck as well. Um, but I've tried to attempt to summarise uh, some of the insights and some of the uh, questions that I think we need to put back to, to you in the community uh, to work on and think about for tomorrow. Um, and just a little bit about how the, the research went. Um, started in May this year, so it's been quite a sort of intensive period of time to conduct it. We had um, over 600 survey respondents, so online, uh, an online survey. And we tried to get about 50 one-to-one -one telephone interviews. I do want to stress that because even though we, of course, invited a big cross-section of people to take part in the interviews, we were conducting them in English, um, primarily from the UK. And so it is quite weighted, um, at least on the interview side, towards those types of members and users. And we, did, um, we were very careful to get a quite a balanced cross-section with those interviews. So we... Um, we got all types of different sizes and stripes of members, but also talked to metadata users and just others in the community. So perhaps you know, scholarly communications, bloggers, and people like that. But one or two, predominantly, it was me it was members. So they were asked um, a number of things. Um, they were asked to recall our mission, um, and we'll go through what what they uh, recall think it is. Um, general perceptions of Crossref, and they were asked about our different services as well and suggestions for the future. And I haven't included those in the summary, but they are in the full report for you to read and study overnight, ready for tomorrow, <laughs> which I'm sure you'll all do after a few drinks. Um, so yeah, it is a very wide-ranging uh, study, and we're still to digest all of the information. And I know uh, we only really shared it out probably, I think, at the weekend. So um, we don't expect you to have read all the data. <laughs> um, so overall perceptions of Crossref, um, some very vivid um, visual uh, descriptions. So we're either a solar system, where we're investing in time travel, um, exploring other planets, and uh, making connections between those galaxies, uh, or some perceive us as a desert. And I think this, I don't know if this is... Um, uh, familiar to many of you as members. So there's vast swathes of lush green fields, well cared for, where things work beautifully, but it quickly devolves into decaying areas where there's a fading out to desert. There's a few little oases along the way that gives the promise of something grander. Um, but there's a large desert you have to cross to get there. And I think uh, that reflects some of the points I've made above um, that sometimes we have taken on so many things at the same time. We've often put out things in beta, and they've stayed in beta for two to three years, um, looking for feedback, but we haven't really followed up and sort of rounded, rounded that off. Um, we do have some technical debt, I think everybody is aware of, anyone who interacts with um, our content registration system. And some of the documentation has been very, very hard to kind of move through. These are all things we are addressing, and uh, we hope to... Uh, to sort of yeah improve upon of course and on the on the good side um, we're perceived as very community driven um, it's you know not we're not concerned with commercial gain and that is appreciated and and, and therefore um, you know perhaps trustworthy and the mission is appreciated I've spelt the word mission wrong that is that is not good <laughs> um, the <laughs> our my Zion is appreciated so um, and also, I think this, um, it's interesting that the, um, the discoverability message seems to be really, really um, uh, unanimous across the board. So Crossref is good for discoverability and findability. So asked to recall what our mission is. Nobody could recall our mission statement. It's the one that has find, cite, link, assess, and reuse um, to put scholarly, scholarly content in context and make um, 
scholarly communications better. But I think on the agreement side, none of those three things at the top are incorrect. They refer to the same sorts of things. So um, we were described by these respondents as our mission is to improve the persistence and stability of content, to enable its discovery and improve its interconnectedness, which I think is spot on. And we might be, you might be seeing some of these phrases come out through our messaging in the future. And there is some smaller groups where things are a little different. Um, so some of us think we are, our mission is to push the open science agenda. Open science isn't a phrase anywhere on our website, I'm pretty sure. And to encourage things like open access by default. Um, and another uh, smaller group think that we are really here to sustain current publishing models and maintain the status quo. And I think um, what this demonstrates is that you know, we're very reflective of our community and there are different missions within the community. So if, this, if we have members and users that have an open science agenda or a, or a sort of traditional publishing model agenda, that's what we're seeing reflected in the research. Um, but both of those groups can use um, Crossref and find us um, useful. So asked about recent changes to Crossref. Um, a lot of people commented on sort of improvements to the website and outreach and looking a bit more professional and being more engaged with the community, um, more than just a service, potentially a sort of thought leader, uh, lending weight to arguments going on in the industry. Um, and some of the things that were, again, from, the, from some smaller groups, um, Perhaps we've been a bit too open to new publishing models or new content types, and that has potentially led to issues of quality. Um, and there's, a, there's a, um, a small but influential group that, that are worried that if we're focusing on services that aren't truly for directly adding value to the traditional membership, um, is that part of the distraction that we talked about on the previous slide? So some of these publishers, small group of publishers, but very large, very influential, probably, probably on the founding list that Ed just showed. Um, this sort of shows like what their expectation is, but then what their experience is. So they expect Crossref to be serving the needs of scholarly publishers and represent that part of the industry. But the experience and actually the, the, the board's mandate and the deliberate expansion um, is that we are supporting the broader scholarly communications infrastructure and discovery chain. And there's a tension there. Um, so they would also like to see us make a distinction between the traditional um, sort of founding publishers, so the historic contribution, um, but then the smaller content owners and independent journals that we now have joining. Um, and there's also a perception, and we'll look at this in the data we'll, we'll go through, um, that um, with volume, there should be potentially a change to the sustainability model. And we really want to tackle that question in one of the workshops tomorrow, tomorrow specifically. What should change about our sustainability model if it is still 88% membership and content registration fees? Should, as the community expands, should the weight and burden of the funding also evolve into that as well? So small to medium members generally feel that their fees are manageable, um, that there are tangible benefits to being more visible through Crossref, and they're invested in our mission and uh, correctly spelt mission. And um, the larger members, let me get that, you know, they, they have visibility. They have long established brands. They have um, international recognition. So visibility through Crossref isn't a priority for them. They're not seeing that as a benefit. Of course, the smaller members are, are seeing a huge benefit being part of that and connected to that, that bigger traditional publishing content. Um, and there's a, a worry, I think, from that group that, um, you know, that as their models are changing and they're looking at different um, revenue sources, um, they have to balance that against the, the sort of more, the wider purpose of Crossref to support the wider community. And again, the feeling that cost really should reduce with the scale. 
Another issue that came out, and I should mention that I'm focusing on the issues that came across. There's so much positive stuff as well. Um, but I wanna, want this meeting to really tackle some of the issues and work through them. So I am focusing on some of the more negative things, just to put that in perspective. Um, so I'm going to read out these quotes. Um, there is some tension between the content owners and then the use of Crossref metadata. So this first one is a, a society. Um, these are both from the US, actually. I don't know that Crossref really appreciates any more the mission of traditional publishers. Asked how? Well, we're advocating for open metadata, um, open free citation metadata, and that's being used by other companies to set up services using that data, potentially in competition with their own interests as well. Um, and then a publisher, again, from the US, if there are people who provide the kinds of services we do, the kind of database products where the metadata is useful, but they don't publish anything, then they can get all of the value by paying very little, um, and, not con and we're not really contributing to where the value lies. It's almost like we're paying to have Crossref make money from distributing metadata and enabling our competitors to take advantage of it, which makes no sense. However, uh, the vast majority of our members see metadata distribution as a key value um, of, and a key benefit of Crossref membership. So here's an example of a quote. Linking and the availability of metadata has been tremendously helpful to scholarly communications over the years, accelerating the pace of innovation. And we had lots of quotes around discoverability as well. Um, a huge user of our open metadata, a huge user group, is in fact our members for cited by services and things like that. Um, and a lot of the initial metadata initiatives were established by these longer standing members. So things that we're now appreciating the whole community is benefiting from, um, things like license URLs, full text links, what was originally called author DOIs, which is of course, as we know, become ORCID, funding data and updates and retractions. These are all things that have been initiated by our long-standing members. And they're not sort of, you know, they're not, they've not been sort of made up by staff deliberately looking for, you know, new revenue streams or anything. Um, so moving away from the sort of the tensions between the larger publishers there is, um, I noticed a, quite a distinction between how Crossref is um, perceived as either a very functional and transactional uh, service uh, where members want to sort of get a DOI and then they're done, or see us as a sort of a higher order mission where they can achieve their agendas through Crossref. So for some people, working with Crossref conferred that higher order benefit, um, making them feel current, keeping plugged into the conversation, um, someone said that it was like taking a step into the future um, and feeling part of the wider community. Uh, Crossref is an important hub for them. Um, and I think this last uh, point as well also talks about how the pub if you're publishing on a smaller scale, you really do benefit from being part of that bigger group. So they can have real impact, um, not just in academia, but across the wider society. And some Crossref users really valued seeing the development of more and more features based on the initial DOI infrastructure, especially where um, it involved saving time for them. So that's a bit more of the functional value. Um, this came through the research as well, and this was probably one of the few things that was a little bit surprising. I don't think we've talked intentionally about open scholarship. Um, but it was mentioned quite a lot in, in some of the survey responses and the interviews. So working with Crossref was a natural extension of their commitments to open scholarship, um, feeling part of a wider community, pushing towards that aim. Uh, people felt like it was a part of their identity and Crossref enables them to, to achieve that. And the fighting the reproducibility crisis. So for some members, their work um, is, you know, trying to improve science in general, and they feel that they can achieve that through Crossref. The, the DOI came up quite a lot in the survey, and we've got 
Jonathan Clark from the DOI Foundation here as well. Um, we've talked about this a lot. Uh, Crossref largely was responsible, I think, at least in this community, for um, promoting the DOI. And that's what all of our services were based on and still are, pretty much. Um, we do have some challenges with that because it, it's led to things like governments mandating DOIs, where in fact what you want them to do is not just get the DOI, but think about the ongoing uh, maintenance of that record. Um, and it's also, it also poses challenges, really, between the registration agencies of the DOI Foundation. For example, we work very closely with data sites, and they should be here and represented here today as, and tomorrow as well. Um, you know, we have it, we're, we're more and more getting asked, why should I join Crossref? Um, over data site or data site over Crossref, and they get asked the same. We don't think that's the right question. We would, we're hoping to work together and have a joint value proposition where we can convey why members sh should support both organizations. Um, so yeah, despite our best efforts, I think it is still seen as a mark of uh, scholarly credibility, actually, in some countries, um, and it really isn't. You can get a DOI for anything, <laughs> so it's not, it doesn't say anything about the quality of the item that you're looking at. And I think that's, that's still an important message we still need to keep driving. And, you know, we don't vet the content, and we need to maybe talk more about that. We've been very, very neutral, deliberately, and even in the, the last board meeting before today, was uh, July, it was deliberately decided that we don't have a public statement about deceptive publishing because that's for the community to decide. There are other groups like the Council on Publication Ethics um, who really are experts in that area. Um, but we, the point before that, we really do keep needing to hammer home that the DOI isn't a, a, a badge of quality at all. And I think, Jonathan, you'll be pleased that DOIs are a gateway drug, because that might be a new, <laughs> new slogan for you. Um, yeah, so this is uh, all very positive, I think, about seeing Crossref as a community hub. Um, so they really appreciate our blogs and uh, talks at conferences to be kept informed. Uh, Crossref's an informal network where best practice and new developments can be shared. Um, and that's what community meant to them. So a loose grouping uh, that we help to bind together via standardization and information provision. And a lot of respondents told the research agency how they trusted Crossref stance on various sector issues and valued the leadership we provide. Um, and again, a space to openly discuss sector and technical developments. So this is, um, I think, coming to the end of my slides. I always think when you're thinking about, um, you know, what is your true value as an organization, you try to imagine what would uh, go wrong if it went away. That's probably the best question. Um, so there's two slides here on uh, how people reacted if Crossref wasn't around anymore. And these are some of the responses. So research outputs would be worse because of the additional costs and time required to access the same materials. The landscape would become balkanized and complex to maneuver within. There's a, a worry or a fear that large publishers um, would exploit the content they have, um, and that's felt to be incompatible with the value of open scholarship, which many think is Crossref's mission. Um, and there would be the end to progressive development, so those new content types and new initiatives, and preprints was mentioned as an example of that. Um, and an existential threat to scholarship in general, with many less likely to support uh, the Crossref agenda if there was a scope for uh, Crossref, you know, going out, going away, uh, for example. A sense of chaos in the scholarly publishing ecosystem, sort of laboring the point now. Uh, new workflows and a lot of work for people. Um, and I think that's a, that's a point to make as well. It's, it's a lot of work, I think, to work with Crossref, and we recognize that, and we're addressing lots of those, um, lots of those niggles. So, yeah, I'll just finish with, uh, you know, Crossref was founded really uh, by a bunch of fierce competitors, <laughs> and we've always tried to balance the different views of different parts of the community, and as that community has diversified, we've reflected that, just as we always have, 
And um, that's really what the theme of this day and a half is, is to think about what those balances are. Should we, re should we be rebalancing, whether that's mission, fees, um, or the types of services we focus on? And yeah, just another encouragement to echo Ed, this is your chance to have your say. And we want to do more meetings like this, where it's not just about you know, updates on products, but really sort of small group discussions and, and listening to each other. Um, and the tables tomorrow are very, you know, it's, it's a bit like a wedding, but they're deliberately designed, you know, so you don't have to sit next to Uncle Bob and, you know, get harassed by him. But also, like, um, but also so that um, it's representative. So we've made sure there are large publishers on each table, there are small publishers, there are ambassadors, um, there are metadata users, there are funders in the room. Um, so it's really, um, yeah, an invitation to have your say. Thank you very much. Thank you.